This island is rarely remembered, and if it is, then usually in the context of the mutiny of the crew of the British ship named Bounty, which occurred on April 28, 1789. And only in the 21st century, in 2004, the whole world was suddenly shocked by information that more than half of the male population of the island were rapists. However, the reaction of the victims themselves was so surprising that Britain, which has jurisdiction over the island, was forced to put the case on the back burner. The island attracted the attention of the world community with its unusual and incredible history. Men, of course, can only envy the main characters of this story. And women, here we could only say, every man to his taste. An inhabited, unhabited island. The reason why the male population of the island was labeled as rapist, in fact, has reason that go back to the distant past, more precisely, in 1798, when the ship of the British Crown Bounty sailing from Tahiti to Jamaica with seedlings of the most valuable breadfruit became the scene of a rebellion. One of the reasons for the riot, according to historians, was that the team, which was relaxed by a vacation in Tahiti, simply did not like the idea of suffering on a tedious six-month trip to Jamaica, while at the same time caring for three siblings. As a result, the captain and 18 of his supporters were landed on the shore, and the rebels returned to Tahiti, where they continued carefree communication with beautiful natives. However, even the least bright of them understood well that sooner or later they would have to answer for the capture of the ship, as soon as the first English ship arrived. So, a discussion of the question of what to do was held, where the opinions of the team were divided. Sixteen people remained in heavenly Tahiti, and the remaining nine decided to get out, taking with them along the way six native men, eleven women, and one boy. Those who remained ended their lives quite badly. Two died of a fever, three were hanged, as expected, by the crew of the first English ship, and the remaining eleven were sent to Australia, where life at that time was not all sunshine and rainbows. Those who sailed away on the bounty soon landed on Pitcairn Island. Christian Fletcher, the helmsman in charge of the team, ordered the ship destroyed after landing on the island in order to hide all traces of mutiny and discourage any desire among the inhabitants to leave the island. By the way, compared to Tahiti, Pitcairn was half rocky, half foresty, and only reptiles and birds lived on it. So, in general, it was far from paradise. Before the destruction of the ship, everything that could and could not be useful was unloaded from the ship, including huge stocks of rum. And then began many days of fun, or rather a binge. In a drunken rage, the sailors and thais fought each other with knives and pistols. In modern terms, a civil war broke out in a microscopic level. To be fair, it must be said that during the breaks men did not forget about the Tatian women generously endowing the beauties with future offspring. However, the result of this internecine war became an incredible situation. The only people left on the island that day were Tahitian women with children from English sailors. All of them became widows, and the only man left was John Adams. Naturally, he became the founder father of the colony, and at the same time, a daddy in the literal sense for all children subsequent born. One family. The most interesting thing is that the locals consider themselves descendants not of Adam, but of Christian Fletcher. Therefore, they bear the surname Christian. Due to all this, the colony lives as one friendly family, and the traditions and customs of the islanders are largely shocking to the world community. However, for all the locals, it is in order of things. To avoid degeneration, marriages are allowed on the island with relatives no closer than second cousins. The language of the islanders is a terrible mixture of English and Polynesian, and many philologists are already inclined to consider the local dialect as a separate Pitcairn language. Another paradox was that despite the British Crown's ownership of the island, Britain cared the least about them. And the remoteness of Pitcairn from shipping routes and airports, the nearest one is 3,000 miles away, also contributed to the fact that the islanders were virtually left to themselves for two centuries. They lived quite well, though. The tropical climate allowed for good harvest. There were enough fish. The only problem was the provision of fresh water. 
In times of drought, the main task was to collect enough rainwater to meet the basic needs. Ships rarely appeared near the island to replenish their supplies of fruit and rest a little. So the locals lived in almost complete isolation, not even realizing what was happening on the planet. Family tradition on the island quite logically corresponded more to the Polynesian way of life. Therefore, girls were sexually active from the age of 12, which was and is considered quite normal. The only city on the island, Adamstown, is inhabited by about 50 people. All the rest dispersed in the villages, engaged in agriculture, fruit gathering and fishing. By and large, the world would not have noticed this place if an English gentlewoman, a police officer, Gail Cox, who visited the island, shocked the enlightened public with the fact that Pitcairn is an island of rapists. A terrible scandal broke out, and the developed world community demanded that the criminals were severely punished. But the locals were confused when they learned that the half of the entire male population of the island would be sentenced to prison terms. As one of the islanders stated, for 200 years the British did not care at all what was happening on the island. Why are they worried now? It's just too expensive for them to support us. And despite the fact that the governor of the island, who was there no more often than the president of the United States in Honduras, denied all accusations, the locals continued to resent. But the English justice was adamant. Fourteen men, including the mayor of Adamstown, were charged with several criminal articles at once. The trial was decided to be held in Adamstown. But during the process, incredible things began to happen. Women, realizing that the police officer simply took advantage of their gullibility, began to massively refuse to testify. Women during the trial completely disagreed with the facts of violence against themselves and with the possible condemnation of men. The latter would lead to the fact that all the islanders would be forced to leave their place of residence. The fact of that liners with cargo could not dock off the island. So men set out in boats and engaged in the transportation of goods and cargo. Women were clearly not capable of this work. All 47 inhabitants of the island during the process periodically protested, tearing down British flags. However, that did not help. The six men were sentenced to the prison terms and transported to New Zealand. The remaining eight received suspended sentences. Immediately after the verdict, an appeal was filed, in which the best lawyers in Australia, Britain and New Zealand insisted on a surprising paradox. Since Britain had not taken any interest in the life of its colony for two centuries, it had also de facto taken no action to change the law. Therefore, the islanders could be judged only according to the laws of the 18th century, when connection with a minor was not considered a crime. However, the release was not achieved, and the last man, who received six and a half years, served his sentence in a prison which was built specially for him on the island. He was released after four years, probably, as the lawyer joked, for exemplary behavior compared to other prisoners. Thanks to the lawsuit, the island became known among tourists, especially exotic lovers. The islanders themselves are doing everything to develop tourism, which only wealthy people can afford. A flight from the nearest island to Pitcairn cost about $2,000. The island's fee is quite small, though, only $35. The main souvenir for tourists is just a stamp in the passport. And by the way, you don't need the visa there, despite its affiliation to Britain.